at my far left, uh, figuratively and literally, is uh, <laughs> Curtis Wilkie. Uh, Curtis, of course, is the uh, inaugural senior fellow at the Overby Center, and appropriately so, because any place called Southern Journalism uh, must have Curtis Wilkie associated with it. We're honored to have Stuart Stevens with us. Uh, some of you know Stuart. Uh, most of you know of Stuart. Uh, he's been a political consultant. Uh, he's the only political consultant I know who actually has a life outside of politics. He's a TV writer and producer, uh, a prolific author, <laughs> and uh, just a general good guy. And uh, it's our honor to have him here today uh, to join uh, with Curtis and me and then with you with a conversation. He's uh, written a number of books. This is his latest book called The Last Season. It's a terrific book. It's uh, about uh, going to every uh, football game, uh, Ole Miss football game a couple of years ago with his 95-year-old father. It's a sports book. It's a family book. It's a sentimental, wonderful love story about him and his father. Um, how on earth did you get this idea, Stuart, to write a book like oh, this? Oh, um, you know, uh, when you lose a presidential race, you find yourself thinking about a lot of things. Um, Stop. Campaign manager for Mitt Romney. Well, and if you have forgotten, they lost. Yeah, we lost. Um, and, I, you know, I, I discovered in politics that the, the, the pain of losing is far greater than the pleasure of winning. Um, and it uh, gives you a lot of time to think and to um, sort of um, reflect on uh, sort of what's important. Um, that same year, uh, my dad was turning 95, uh, and, and I had turned 60, uh, both of which seemed sort of unimaginable to me. Um, and when I was growing up in Jackson, a lot of the ways that my dad and I connected was through college football, um, particularly Ole Miss football. You know, Ole Miss played a lot of games in Jackson and at Memorial Stadium. So the idea of uh, spending time with him and my mother, uh, recapturing that, um, it, just, it just came to me. Um, I didn't know if I would do it as a book originally. But I talked to them about it, and um, so we just decided to give it a go. And how does your father feel about this book now? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, he drug his father, I mean, he accompanied his father all over the South. And that, just the logistics of getting a 95-year-old man uh, to a stadium, it's hard for us to get to the stadium. Well, uh, you know, um, it's sort of like uh, in high school when I bought a, a Volkswagen uh, bus and I asked the guy how fast it went and he said, well, son, just leave a little earlier. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, he gets around. He gets around great. Um, it's just better not to get in a hurry. Uh, I, I don't. I don't really know what he thinks of it. I think, I mean, he says that he, he really likes it. Uh, but I think he would say that if he didn't. Um, but uh, hopefully he likes it. I, I, I suspect he likes it more than he doesn't. Well, it is a love story. I mean, your affection for him comes out in here in very strong ways. Well, I think. Um, I think any time uh, parents and, and kids can find something that they enjoy doing that kind of gives them a way to talk about everything uh, without talking about anything, it's, it's sort of a special uh, space. And you know, for my dad now, that was that was football, um, and it was so vivid you know, in the 60s, because it was sort of interlaced with all these cultural, um, you know, racial elements of what was going on in the South then. And I, I am sort of fascinated by the way in which football has changed the South, and the South has changed football. 
Um, and I, I think it's much like the role of rugby and uh, South Africa and rugby. Um, and I think it's a, a sort of arc of, of where the South was and where we are now um, is embodied. And you can tell that story really through college football. And that was part of what drew me to actually writing about it. Because you know, when I started out doing this, I didn't know if I would write about it because I thought we might go to a couple of games and you know, it wouldn't work. Um, or you know, we'd kind of get tired, or he would get tired. But in fact, you know, he wanted to go to all the games and would sit through all, you know, to every play, he's really into all the games. So, um, but, but part of what makes it to me a fascinating uh, story is this whole history and intersection of these two big cultural forces, college football and civil rights. You know, you're, this is a little bit of a memoir of you, or it's certainly an insight into you and your family's history. And uh, as you read this book, you realize that uh, uh, Stewart came from uh, a mother and a father who were very progressive. I think in Mississippi, you'd say liberal uh, in terms of their embracing of civil rights. Um, and so I would ask the question, how do you go from the there with your family, uh, liberal background, to becoming a mostly Republican political consultant? Well, you know, when I grew up uh, and started working in campaigns, with the exception of William Winter, who I, I worked in all of his losing campaigns, <laughs> finally when I quit working for him, he was able to win. Um, you know, all, the Democrats were, you know, Eastland and Stennis, and it was a Democratic machine. The first Republican I ever worked for was Ted Cochran. Um, so, I mean, the idea of coming up and going to work for the machine <laughs> You know, unless you wanted to be like a county clerk in, you know, Itawamba County or something. Um, you know, what, what fun was that? Mm -hmm. And of course, the Democratic Party at that time was sort of in this great schism um, with the, what was it, the, what was the 67 convention with the New Democratic Party or the, the uh, Freedom Democratic Party, yeah. Freedom Democratic Party. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the real Democratic Party was Tennyson and Eastland, and um, that seemed to be very much sort of, you know, the old politics. Mm -hmm. um, and once you sort of start working on one side, it's sort of skins and shirts in politics. And if you try to go back and forth between parties, it, it's very difficult. You end up not being trusted by either party. Uh, there's a famous political consultant, uh, who recently died, David Garth. You remember David Garth? And, and he worked for um, some Republicans, some, but he said he would only work for Republicans that he could get to by subway. Uh, he was based in New York City. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, uh, there, there really weren't any Democrats then that I wanted to work for. Mm -hmm. you know, Garth also worked for the Likud party in Israel, so, so there. I've worked, I've, you know, uh, I've, I've worked in Israel. I worked for Sharon in Israel. And, you know, there's oh, a, there's a, uh, I had the moderate in that race. He worked, he was running against Netanyahu. So um, it's a, there's a funny pattern of, of American political consultants working abroad. Um, but anyway, it's another conversation. You know, uh, well, it was about two years ago that the three of us sat right here before an Overby Center audience and kind of had a post-mortem of the uh, 2012 campaign beginning to look forward. We're here on the cusp of a new election year. And first obvious question is, do you have a horse? Oh, um, you know, our firm has done uh, Governor Christie's races before. Um, but uh, really, we, my partner, Russ Schrieffer uh, uh, and Ashley O'Connor, uh, who's a managing partner of our firm, have worked with Governor Christie. I haven't. So the firm is working with Governor Christie, but I'm really not. So um, I'm not, no. We're doing a bunch of governors and senators, but I'm not involved in the presidential. You, we, uh, we had lunch beforehand and had a fairly spirited conversation. I wanted to uh, uh, maybe get you to go back over some of the ground, uh, particularly relating to what you think is going to become of Donald Trump? Well, you know, I wrote a piece for the Daily Beast 
uh, positing that Donald Trump won't actually end up on the ballot in the presidential. I think he'll withdraw first. Um, I wrote it maybe five weeks ago, six weeks ago. Uh, and I, I still believe it. I, I think that in the Trump world, the greatest uh, put down is to be a loser. Uh, what do we know about running for politics? Uh, for president, we know most people lose. I mean, it's like the Super Bowl. Mo Very few people get to the Super Bowl, and there's some reason to believe that 50% of the people, the teams that get there lose. Um, so I, I don't see in his psychology um, that he will risk being a loser when he's been a business success, and he could say that he could have won. So, I mean, what do we know? People don't change, and I think people over 65 never change. Um, so I can't imagine that he's going to do something that is completely out of his own character. And, and the other thing is, you know, Donald Trump is, seems to be a guy, I mean, God love him, that does what he enjoys. What do we know about running for president? It's the least enjoyable experience that, you know, an adult can enter into voluntarily. Um, so I don't think he'll go the distance. Um, right now, I think Donald Trump has been having fun. And it's fun to hang out with people that are having fun. So have the Democrats. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think he'll be, he's starting to have less fun now. You can see it just in the last week or so. It's hard to imagine someone more temperamentally unsuited to the process of running for president. Um, so I think it'll all, uh, sort of go away. So in the end, who, who emerges from this spectacle? Um, spectrum. Mm. Well, it is a spectacle. For Republicans, it's a spectrum as opposed to a it's spectacle. It's a spectrum, too, but it's also a spectacle. Well, well, it is funny. You know, there's sort of two things said about the Republican Party, sort of two. One, that, you know, it's all the same as, you know, a bunch of boring white guys that are all the same. The, the other is that the party is in a civil war and is so uh, cantankerous that it can't get along. I can believe one, I can believe the other. I can't believe both. Um, and maybe both aren't <laughs> true. Um, look, I, I, I think that the party won't nominate anybody who hasn't been elected to office before. So who does that rule out? That rules out Trump, that rules out Carson, that rules out Fiorina. Um, I don't think Cruz will win. Um, I, I tend to think the race will come down to Cruz and whoever is going to win. Um, and I think that'll either be Christie, Bush, or Rubio. Now, you worked uh, for George Bush. I did. And so are there any comparisons? We that, won. And you won. That's right. Uh, are there any comparisons that you could or, or we should draw between the two Bush brothers? Oh, um, they're all very different, I think. Um, I, I, I like Jeb a lot. I, I don't know him well, but I've known him for a long time. I think he's a really interesting, complicated, in a fascinating way person. I mean, I anybody who converts to Catholicism in their 40s has a lot of stuff going on. Um, and I think he's really smart. Um, I think it is very difficult in politics to not have run for as long as he has not run. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he never really had a primary. And the party has changed so much. I think as a consultant, it's almost impossible to sit out a cycle. I mean, I know that if we hadn't done a lot of races in 2010, that we really, I uh, really would have been lost doing all these primaries for Romney in 2012. And then if we hadn't done all those primaries in 2012, would have been really lost doing the Thad Cochran primary here, which was probably the toughest primary in the country, as you know. It's like the NFL, it, it's the, it changes so fast. You, you can't sit out. Um, so Jeb is entering this and he hasn't really dealt with these voters, dealt with this party in so long. Um, and I think that that's very, very difficult. Um, it's, it's a very strange process, but it's the process. You can't, 
deny the process. It is what it is. Um, you know, it's like saying, well, I think the Super Bowl is too much of a spectacle. Well, that's OK, fine, but it's the Super Bowl. Um, I, I think you know, those first four races are going to be really determinative, uh, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and Nevada. And I think to win, you have to win. So what I would say where I'm involved in one of these races is, where am I going to win? And I don't think that we're going to have this big SEC primary. I don't think that you can have a strategy where the race begins where it's convenient for you to begin. I mean, that's been tried. Al Gore tried it in 88. You remember that. Um, Giuliani tried it when he tried to do it in Florida. Races begin when they begin. Um, you can't say, I prefer it to begin later. So um, I think, you know, who's going to win Iowa? Who's going to win New Hampshire? Who's going to win South Carolina? Who's going to win Nevada? I think that'll narrow this down to whoever will be the nominee. What, what's your reaction to the news today by the Speaker of the House? And what does that do to the perception of the Republican Party nationally? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. You know I don't know how much Boehner is tied into the image of the party. I don't. It's a, it's a good question. I, I, I think it depends really on who replaces him. Um, I mean, look, uh, 30 some odd percent of the country can't name the vice president unaided. So. Um, I think it's, it'll depend on who replaces him. I don't know. What do you see happening on the Democratic side? Um, if I had to bet on Hillary Clinton or the field, I would take the field. Um, we've never really seen a race like Hillary, or a candidate like Hillary Clinton, where she's just gone consistently down. You know, most candidates are like stocks. They'll go down, they'll go up, they'll plateau, they'll go up. They'll... She's just gone consistently down. Um, that's very unusual in politics. And, you know, and if you look at it, each stage, they've said, OK, she's going to announce it and she'll go up. And that didn't happen. They said she's going to start announcing all these policies. And she, she has very serious policies. And that hasn't helped. They said, well, she's going to campaign. That hasn't helped. Then she's going to go on the air. That hasn't helped. Um, she's going to apologize for this email stuff. That hasn't helped. She just keeps going down. Um, it's like she's losing five dollars on every sale, but it's going to make it up on volume. <laughs> um, I think that my bet is the Democratic nominee is not in this race. Um, you know, as we were talking earlier, I, I, I think to get in the race and beat Hillary Clinton is different than getting in the race to save the White House. And I think that some candidate either Vice President Biden or John Kerry or Elizabeth Warren will be drawn into the race to save the White House. You now have Hillary Clinton losing to these different Republicans. Um, and I think, that base, I think that that'll happen. Um, she's getting crushed by, by Bernie Sanders uh, in New Hampshire. She's not doing well against him in Iowa. And, and actually, you know, I, I think what's happening in the Democrat side is, is much more interesting what's happening on the Republican side. It's, it's historic. And that's a word we toss around. But for the first time in history, we have a socialist who is closing in on a Democratic front runner. And we've had lots of socialists run for president, and that's never happened before. And it's interesting to me, and it's probably because of you know, Trump being so pyrotechnical and such, you know, such a nut, that we don't talk about this. Or, and, and I think that there has been a reluctance to take Bernie Sanders seriously. But I think it is part of a larger uh, phenomenon that's happening you know, around the world. If you look at what happened in England, you know, the Labor Party is now named the Socialists. You look at what's happening in Greece, and then you look at what's happening with Bernie Sanders. I don't think these are isolated events. I mean, you, you, you look at uh, some of the movement in Canada, which has been much more to the left. I, I find it fascinating. I mean, Bernie Sanders. He's a stone cold socialist. And, and what he, he's been saying the same thing for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the data, the people that are for Sanders 
know a lot about Bernie Sanders. They, that is an active choice. They have not just sort of flirted with Bernie Sanders. Um, a lot of people who say they're for Trump really don't know much about Trump. I mean, we don't know much about Trump. We don't know, for instance, has Donald Trump voted? Has he voted for Democrats? He voted for, I mean, it's just, he's sort of this empty vessel you fill with your anger or frustration or amusement or hope or whatever, um, which is one of the reasons I think he'll, he'll go away. But it's a big event. I mean, if we woke up tomorrow and, and Bernie Sanders and John Lewis were standing together, Congressman Lewis were standing together and said they were going to run as a ticket, could they win? Get my vote. But, yeah, there you go. I mean, the whole reason that, that, that Hillary Clinton says she's going to beat Sanders is that uh, he doesn't appeal to African American voters and that they're going to get into the South and she's going to win with African American voters, which is pretty extraordinary considering you know, she lost African American voters to you know, Senator Obama. Mm -hmm. She lost women to Senator Obama, though. Um, so, I, you know, to me, uh, if I was in that campaign, whenever you hear them talk, they talk about their process, how they're going to have this structure, this, uh, their field work is going to win. Uh, and I think that's a very dangerous. They, they talk about how they're going to win, not why they're going to win. Mm. Bernie Sanders talks about why he's going to win, because mm -hmm. people are angry, because you can't buy things, because uh, you know, household income is stagnated, uh, because the un real unemployment numbers are, are really bad, which they are. Um, you know, it, it's fascinating to me. When you listen to, to President Obama talk about the country, and when you listen to Bernie Sanders talk about the country, you know, they're different countries. And, it, 28% of the people think the country's headed in the right direction right now. And I think it completely belies the relatively low unemployment numbers. But the, the reality is that very few people have benefited from the recovery. And you know, Republicans have not been very good talking about those that have sort of been left behind. And I think that there has been sort of a conspiracy of silence amongst those who traditionally are these voices because they've wanted to support President Obama and they haven't wanted to help Republicans. So um, we, we have this explosion of wealth in New York and in DC, which have become increasingly media centers. And I think that that affects the tone of the conversation. Um, but if you look out in the country, uh, there's a reason 28% of the people think the country is headed in the wrong direction. And it's not foreign policy. It's, economics. You know, we have 40% more people on food stamps. We have uh, child uh, poverty has gone up from 18 to 22%. Um, and, you know, it's, I think it is a, a huge problem that we have lacked these voices. I mean, instead of John Steinbeck, we have John Stewart, you know, who's a very clever social critic, but he's not a voice for the uh, those who aren't doing well in America. I mean, he's a millionaire from New Jersey. Um, you know, he's, he's not John Steinbeck. And I, I think we need more of those voices. You know, there's, there's a history to these kind of candidates that you're talking about, these, these movements in both parties today, but this has gone on before. You know, I used to call them the send a message candidates, whether it's Jesse Jackson or Ross Perot uh, all these people, and they are tapping into that 28 or 25 percent that's angry mm -hmm. and uh, uh, lashing out and latching on to these people. And when you have a crowded field of candidates, you know, that 25 percent looks pretty good, but it gets winnowed out pretty quickly. And for that reason, I, yeah, I agree with you. I, I think Trump's not going to go very far. That's why I find the Bernie Sanders thing more interesting, because it's not a crowded field. And he's doing so well. Um, and you know, if you look at the intensity of the Sanders vote, it's much more intense than, than, than Hillary Clinton's vote. Um, it's, and if you go up to New Hampshire and you go to 
you know, as I've done a fair amount, just out of curiosity, and you go to a Sanders event and you go to a Hillary Clinton event, I mean, it's night and day. Um, and, you know, what's interesting about Sanders is if you look at the demographics, the, he does better with lower income, less educated voters. And there's sort of a perception, I think, out there that he would appeal to, you know, a sort of a university crowd. Actually, those are Hillary voters, more. Um, now, Sanders is in Vermont, which is the whitest state in the nation. Um, you know, I remember when Dean looked like he might be the nominee, and I was working in the Bush campaign, some uh, geek in the, in the Bush campaign figured out that, who was from New York, figured out that like at any given moment there were more minorities on the F train in New York than live in Vermont. <laughs> um, I mean, there literally were like under 3,000 minorities in Vermont. Um, so, you know, this has not been a uh, strength of Bernie Sanders, which he, he realizes. Um, and it, it's sort of fascinating to see him try to build that bridge. So he does have a history in the civil rights movement uh, as an activist. But. You know, you ran a presidential campaign. Curtis and I have covered presidential campaigns. We know how arduous and complex running for president is. Having been through that, you now are really uh, one of a handful of experts on presidential campaigns. If you could wave a magic wand, would, how would you change the process to uh, give a better result? Listen, I, I'm glad you asked that. I, I would go back to federal funding of presidential campaigns in a heartbeat. Um, I've, I've become a complete... Uh, well, you say go back. You mean in your own mind. We hadn't left it. There's still... No. You, you I still mean, have so, a well, chance to... Well, there are federal funds that go into presidential campaigns. But, not, you know, in, 1980, in, in the 2008 campaign, Barack Obama became the first uh, Putin, nominee yeah. to reject it. Right. And um, after promising he wouldn't, mm -hmm. McCain took it. Mm -hmm. um, and that has blown up the system. Mm -hmm. And the Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court. Two years later. I, even with Citizens United, um, I would go back to federal funding. And I think that all the, the candidates. Cap spending. I would go back to the system that we had, which was cap, you know, where, where when you were the nominee, you got that check and you couldn't spend more than that. Um, you know, having done campaigns under both systems, you know, 2012 was the first time we've had an incumbent president not in the federal funding system since Nixon. And, you know, the Obama, Obama campaign raised $1.2 I think the next incumbent president, Democrat or Republican, should be able to raise north of $2 billion. Mm. So think about it. They're going to run against a Democrat or Republican, an, an opposition uh, a, a party, that probably the nominee will emerge broke from that process, as they usually do. So I mean, I think that we've basically abolished, short of some major scandal, the four-year term without realizing it. Um, and if you go back and you look at the debate over federal funding, which was 76, a lot of the discussion was sort of good government, you know, after Watergate. But a lot of it was also, and they got Republicans to vote for it this way, that like under the, without limits and without federal funding, a president of the United States could raise unlimited money. And if you had a Democrat, they could raise unlimited money and you'd never vote them out. And Republicans go, yeah, okay, so I'll vote for it. And it's amazing that the system stayed stuck that long. And, you know, uh, you, you, Jimmy Carter could have stepped out of the system as an incumbent president. Uh, Reagan could have. Uh, uh, Clinton could have. Bush could have. And they all stayed in. Um, and I think it is a huge disservice to the process that the Obama campaign stepped out of that system. I think that he is the only candidate that was positioned such that he could have done it without being killed by the press. Um, I don't think Hillary Clinton, had she been the nominee, would have done it or could have gotten away with it. But he was in such a sweet spot with the press that he, he was able to get away with it. You know, the history of campaign finance is such that once you get away from these reforms, it's very hard to get back to them. Um, so I would go back to that. Um, that still doesn't undo Citizens United, which is a whole constitutional issue. 
But having seen these candidates now have to raise money as nominees in the fall, I think it is a huge disservice. I mean, so, so Mitt Romney uh, was the first to have to do this as a nominee, not as an incumbent president. So, uh, you know, he, Romney had to raise, after he finally won the nomination in April, uh, $100 million a month. And, and that's just, that's an awful, awful situation. And what's incredibly frustrating is to see, you know, a candidate go spend, you know, eight, 10, 12 hours a day raising money. Then you get back on the plane, you write checks, probably 65 to 70% of that money goes to the parent organizations of the news organizations that are covering it, mm -hmm. you know, to pay for advertising. And then they write that you're not campaigning. Hmm. It's, it's, it's enough to make you, you know, and so head explode. You were on the receiving, you in writ large, were on the receiving end of that money before. And just maybe it's stating the obvious to you, but maybe not to the general public. So what is the ill effect of all this money? If you want well, to count. One thing, it, candidates have to raise all this money. Mm -hmm. The process of raising. Yeah, which means, if nothing else, forgetting the pro, you know, whether or not you know, that corrupts the system because they're going out and asking people for it, which I tend to think is exaggerated, personally. But it means you're spending a lot of time. And the one thing that every campaign has the same amount of is time. So it means that you're doing fewer events with voters. It means that you're doing fewer candidate forums. Um, it, it, it means uh, you know you're 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 just not out exchanging with voters as much, um, and that's a, I think a terrible corruption of the system. Uh, not corruption; it's a terrible misuse of time, um, and it it becomes about raising money. Um, I think it's, you know, we still have the limits that, that we had. Uh, but still, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very negative consequence. Um, Was it uh, at a fundraiser that uh, Romney made the 47% yeah, comment? I was there. You were there. And yeah, did you know, uh, of course, you didn't know that was going to become public. I was in but the even kitchen, then, actually, eating. <laughs> But um, even then, did you did your alarms go off? Or? I, I didn't hear it. Um, you know, that's an, it's very interesting. Uh, you know, that was like the eleventh event that we did that day, um, and it was just me and Garrett Jackson, who you know we, uh, went to uh, we were the only staffers with him. Um, you know, I'd heard this thing a million times. I had to edit some spots. I was editing some spots, and I was hanging out in the kitchen eating, which is what I usually did. Because um, these things, one thing you can say about fundraisers is they usually have really good food. <laughs> um, it was in this guy's big house. Um, so I, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't hear him say it. Um, I, and I'd never I heard him, ex it wasn't something he normally said. You know, it came kind of in the answer to a question. Right. Um, but, you know, when President Obama does these events, uh, they have the Secret Service confiscate all electronic devices before question and answers. Um, the Secret Service had, had offered, well, Romney didn't have Secret Service protection then. Um, oh, I no, I guess we did. Yeah. I guess we did. Yeah, and they, they had offered to do that for us, um, ostensibly as a security thing. You know, Mitt's feeling was, uh, you know, it was sort of disrespectful to people. You know, um, and even after this came out, he wouldn't do it at other fundraisers. Um, but you know, I think it shows how much more difficult it is to run for president now. And it's changed the, the dynamic with the press on the plane is something you could really appreciate if it, because everybody has a camera. So this, this whole idea that you're gonna come and even if you're gonna try to be off the record, are you really gonna be off the record? So, you know, every 
not only a reporter, but every citizen is a reporter. And there's good things about that, and there's bad things about that. Um, but it is what it is. And I think it makes the process of running for president much more arduous on a candidate. Um, and you know, one thing I think we're seeing, particularly with these Republicans that are running, a lot of these Republicans, uh, quietly or not so quietly, were critical of the Romney campaign. And a lot of the staffers who work in these campaigns were critical of the Romney campaign. And I think they're getting a sense now of how difficult it is to run for president. Um, it is so much different than any other process in politics. It's just, it's, until you do it, it's unimaginable how difficult it is. I mean, look at 2012. The people who knew the most about it were probably Haley Barber and Mitch Daniels, both of whom decided not to run. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every campaign produces iconic moments, and the campaigns in snapshot, looking back, are remembered for that. And sometimes they repre represent a true message, and sometimes they don't. Bush looking at his watch right. during the debate. And the 47%, uh, for better or worse, became kind of one of those iconic moments. Bad rap, uh, something that you could have countered, looking back on it, or just the well, breaks? I mean, you know, um, I mean, it was something he said. You know, we, I, I think actually, I'm very skeptical of the whole story of how this became public. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really buy the bartender, Carter. It, it all doesn't make sense. But it, it doesn't really matter because it's something that, you know, he said. And at the time, inside the campaign, um, you know, this is, this is, I think, a quality that Mitt Romney has. He was, hey, you know, this was something that, you know, uh, 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 it was a bad moment, but let's go forward. We can't undo this moment. What's the next chance we have? And if you go and you look at it, that came out on a Monday. Two days later, he had this big Hispanic forum in Miami, um, a big event with um, uh, the Univision uh, anchor. Um, and he, you know, he was, let's just focus on that. That's the next event we have. Um, and he was fantastic in that event. And, and that's really, you know, it's like a, a really high level quarterback. You know, like you throw an interception. OK, let's, let's don't do that again. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. we can't unthrow that. Mm -hmm. Let's, well, let's score the next play. Um, and that's, that's a remarkable quality that will infect the whole campaign. Um, and it's those moments when campaigns can fall apart and start um, kind of eating each other. Um, we had a moment like that in New Hampshire, you know. Uh, we had a 65-point lead for George Bush, and we lost by 19, which you got to really work at. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I went around all day when we got the exit polls saying, look, you know, Ronald Reagan won New Hampshire and fired everybody. Um, we're going to lose by, like, over 15. But then, you know, Bush got like a little group of us together and said, look, you know, I, I screwed this up, you screwed it up, but the only thing that's going to really piss me off is if I hear anybody else in this room criticize anybody else. We lost. It's over. We'll go to South Carolina, we'll win, and a year from now, everybody here is going to come to the White House, and you guys are going to have a drink. I don't drink, but then we're going to laugh about this. And it was a time when, you know, the campaign, we all felt terrible, you know, could have easily fallen apart. Um, and you know, it's when you can kind of go, okay, let's go in. And I think that that's really uh, these moments when campaigns can, you know, crack or stay together. I want to ask one more question about Governor Romney, and then I want to go to the audience for questions uh, before Curtis and I ask some more. Um, they're uh, still a little boomlet as people are dissatisfied with the. Republican candidates now that maybe Mitt Romney would get back in. Any chance? Um, you know, I, I, I have no idea. Um, running for president is such a personal decision. Um, you know, when, he, when this came out in January, he was, he was considering it. 
I, I think it was a very personal decision. This idea that George, that, that he didn't run because of Jeb Bush is n nonsense. I mean, we, they said, well, you know, Jeb Bush was going to raise all this money. You know, we were laughing about this. You know, people forget that, you know, Mitt Romney put in $44 million in 2008. So the idea that it, if he was going to run again, money was going to stop him was sort of laughable. Um, it was almost sort of charming, like he couldn't afford to run. Um, I, I don't know. Um, you know, I never talked to him about it. Um, you know, I talk to him a fair amount, but we talk about things in life. He's an extraordinarily um, positive person. I say his father had this quality, you know, that he doesn't look back. And um, he's, a, he's a happy person. There's not a bitter bone in his body. He's sort of the Annie Nixon. <laughs> you know, he's not haunted. I think he realizes that he's extraordinarily fortunate in life on multiple levels. Um, He's very engaged in these charities that he's doing, um, and very engaged uh, with this effort that Ann Romney has on neurological diseases. Um, her health has always been more of an issue than, well, now she's, than they talked about during the campaign. And in the campaign, it was more of an issue than anyone realized. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, you know, she's talking about it now more. She's written this really wonderful book, which I've read. It's coming out in like a week uh, about it. Um, if he did, uh, I think it would be a very personal decision. I don't know what factors would have to, mm -hmm. to, to, to play. Um, but a week, uh, as Harold Wilson said, a week is a long time in politics. Yeah. Uh, questions from the audience? Yes, sir. I would argue that the exact opposite lesson is at play with the Clintons. That, you know, as Hillary Clinton said in one of these letters that came out to a friend of hers uh, at the uh, Clinton Library, uh, that from like 1994, that people in Washington, she was marveling how people in Washington, quote unquote, have a low pain threshold. They have a very high pain threshold. <laughs> and it has proven to be successful for them. So I can't imagine her getting out. Um, I mean, he's the guy who, you know, uh, as, as Curtis was there, uh, should have been driven from the race in New Hampshire in, the, in 1992. Um, I do think, you know, had Bill Clinton resigned during the uh, Monica Lewinsky stuff, Al Gore would have become president, and I think Al Gore would have been elected president. It's kind of an interesting thing. Um, you never would have beaten an incumbent Al Gore, given the economics of the time. But I can't imagine her doing it. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Oh, Paul Feinbaum, <laughs> center of the universe, man. Um, Good well, first, it's a twofer, because I got to do it at the Manning Center. We did the uplink, which was like to get to go in the Manning Center like that was fantastic, you know. Um, they had to throw me out. I was like wandering around. <laughs> um, uh, and I mean, Paul, if you haven't read Paul Feinbaum's book, uh, uh, my conference can beat your conference. It's really a fascinating book. It, it, it's really about Paul Feinbaum and his journey into sports and finding this community of fans. Uh, it, it's a very personal, really very, very interesting, powerful book. And there's very few people in journalism who have that kind of impact on people. 
I'm going to follow with the football question. Uh, you told me you just went with your now 97-year-old dad. Incidentally, Stuart's father, and I know a lot of you here know him, but he's a wonderful guy, very successful lawyer. You went back to Tuscaloosa again um, last weekend. I did. What was that like, and what was Phineas Stevens' reaction? Uh, he was happy. <laughs> uh, you know, that is the loudest stadium I have ever been in. Um, I, I, we were with these uh, Alabama fans, so we were very well behaved. But um, I cannot imagine how these kids can keep their composure. I mean, the kids on the field. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, uh, somebody invited us up into one of these fancy boxes very nicely. and. You, you couldn't hear yourself, when they really get going, you couldn't hear yourself talk in the box. Mm. And then to be down on the field like that, it's unimaginable to me, the kind of uh, maturity or whatever you want to call it, to, to not crack under that. Um, it, you know, uh, in 2013, when my dad and I went, they were very, very nice to us, everybody, the people who worked there, the fans, everything. But as my dad said, that's because they know they're going to win. Um, but afterwards, they were very nice as well. I mean, just, you know, the fans were very, I think, stunned. Um, but, you know, they were, they were very, they were nice. You've got a perfect new chapter for your paperback. <laughs> <laughs> Perry. How do you explain to your friends in New York and L.A., Northeast, about the SEC and, and, and the way people are about college football down here? Um, it's like a Canadian trying to explain hockey, you know. I, I was up in uh, Canada when the U.S. played Canada for the goal, and Canada won. And you know how polite Canadians are. And I was at this, this uh, restaurant bar, and these Canadians were going crazy. And uh, this very nice uh, Canadian came over to us and said, you know, I'm sorry, but you have to understand, it just means more to us. <laughs> which I thought was so, so sweet. Um, uh, you know, I have to say, you know, all the years I lived in New York, the, the, and I write about this some in the book, the most depressing thing was like, you know, trying to talk to people about football or when they would try to talk to you and they would get like excited about like the Holy Cross Yale game, you know, it's like, oh God. Um, I think uh, that what it means to the South is unique to the South for all these cultural reasons. Um, and it's just, it's very, very uh, difficult to translate. Um, but we, we were talking earlier, you know, I, I think that's one of the reasons that, that Ole Miss is, is probably defines Mississippi more than any other university defines another state. Um, and there's been bad things about that in the past, and I think right now it's, it's a very positive thing. Um, when you think about it, 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 for a lot of reasons, you know, the, the size of the state, lack of other institutions, lack of other prominent institutions, there's no great businesses that dominate here, you know, there's no, you've got the University of Oregon, but you've got Nike. Um, you know, there's a few businesses in California besides you know, USC, and, um, but I, I think that that's sort of a part of a, a special role that, that Ole Miss has played here, which I think is very, very positive right now. Mm -hmm. Other question? Yes, sir. Um, I have no idea. I, I, you know, I, I um, maybe naively, but I, I just go back to the unlikelihood of it. Um, I, I just, I, I think parties go crazy, but I don't think they stay crazy. Um, I, I think that um, they have, they'll have seizures of craziness, um, but I think Look, there's 318 million people in the country. It's a big country. Um, 
And I, I you know, most people get, get along more than they don't get along. We don't have civil unrest for the most part. And I think, you know, we don't have a history of radical parties in America succeeding. Um, you know, you go to England even, you have a communist party. Um, you know, I've worked a lot abroad. Uh, you know, you, you'll have parties that are extremist parties on the left and the right. We really don't have that. Um, in fact, you know, one of the great complaints are the two parties are too much alike. Um, I mean, if you look at, at Barack Obama, in many ways, if Barack Obama was a Republican, you know, he's been in many ways a perfect plutocratic president. The stock market has boomed. We have the greatest inequality in history. The top 1% have thrived. Uh, we have a sharp increase in poverty. And the middle class has gotten smaller, like, you know, some lefty he was. Uh, and we're at war, more or less, in Syria, Yemen, uh, Iraq, um, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, we have uh, increased drone strikes. Uh, it, it, he's not. In, in that way, some radical leftist president. Um, so I just think the likelihood of one of these splinter candidates or, or extremist candidates getting elected is short of some cataclysmic event in the economy. You know, if you take 2008 and the economy doesn't come back, I think that's the only thing that would trigger it. Andy? No idea. It's a very interesting question. I have no idea. Um, I mean, I think in part because we don't know the science yet. Um, I, I, I have no idea. I mean, it's so unknown. Um, I mean, the history of parents letting their kids do things that they know will hurt them is not great. I mean, look at uh, all of the things that you know, we did as kids or like things we did as kids that now kids do with helmets. You know, I mean, we'd roller skate and our kids you know, skateboard with helmets. You go skiing with helmets. I don't, but you know, I just can't bring myself to do it. But um, you know, history will show, all the movement is the more safety. You have car seats, you know, how do we have a whole generation, you know, generations and generations that seem to survive without car seats? Um, you know, I have no idea. I, I think there'll be a lot of science on it. Um, and we just don't know if it's re repetitive hits. We don't, it's, it's very unformed. Uh, but I would assume it's one of the reasons soccer is growing in popularity. I told you that uh, Stuart wrote a book that uh, is multi-layered. He wrote with great insight into the culture of the South as he was weaving his personal story and the story of he, him and his father going to uh, football games. Uh, I was uh, struck uh, about what you wrote about the South as it related to uh, Southern symbols and uh, the Civil War. He wrote, it is still living with the Civil War that separates the South from the North, more than victory or defeat. No one in the North thinks about the Civil War, which is the ultimate humiliation for the South. To win a war is to be free to move on. To be conquered is to live with the consequences forever. What about all this with the Confederate symbols now? Well, I think it shows how wise the university was to deal with this, what, eight years ago now? Uh, I mean, imagine if Ole Miss hadn't done that and what it would be like to be dealing with it now. I mean, it would be extraordinarily traumatic. Um, and it's actually pretty amazing that Ole Miss did it when it did it. Um, 
And I find it very interesting on this uh, issue of the state flag that both football coaches, you know, uh, Mullins and Fries, have come out to replace the state flag. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know where, I don't know what the right thing is here. You know, I, I, I don't know um, where the line is. Um, should, should Washington and Lee not be Washington and Lee? Mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't know. I mean, should, should, should all Confederate um, statues be relegated to museums? I, I, I don't know what the line is. Um, I mean, I, th I think it's an interesting question for society. I don't really feel that like I'm in a place to answer that question. I mean, to be honest, you know, I, I, I don't know if I could have picked the Mississippi state flag out of a book. I never really thought about it. Mm -hmm. um, I, but I know that it troubles a lot of people uh, a great deal. Um, I don't have any feelings about it. I mean, I, one, I mean, I look, it doesn't mean anything to me. Um, but I, 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 I think it just this shows how much we're still wrestling with all of this. Um, I don't know. So for all of us who finally, who are dealing with personal relationships and careers, you uh, suggest that maybe you wish you had spent more time with your father, and your father says the same thing as it relates to you. What is the lesson for all of us in our personal relationships and balancing that with careers? Well, you know, I um, probably, uh, what, 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 to me, uh, I felt very driven to try to prove that I could succeed, to prove, to, and I think to a larger degree than I realized to my father that I could succeed. And that meant to me at that time to succeed beyond Mississippi, um, uh, as did Curtis. Uh, and You know, when, I, when I, I moved to New York, you know, I, I think I lived there for years before I knew anybody who wasn't from Mississippi. Um, and that, I, I, I always was someone who embraced stress and embraced uh, uh, challenges. What I liked about campaigns was it was a socially accepted way to fight. And you know that's a harder thing to find as you get older, than not sort of be branded a psychopath or a complete maladjusted person. Um, and uh, I think that uh, one of the realizations you know that I came to was that my father could have cared less about this. He just wanted me to be happy. Um, you know, I'm not an anti-stress advocate. I think stress is good. I think challenges are good. Um, I think being driven is good. Um, but I think um, maybe stopping and asking yourself, what is it that you can do now that you can't do later, is not a bad question as well. You know, this rumor that we're mortal is probably true. Um, and that, that can lead you in different directions. It can lead you to not necessarily, you know, it can, it can lead you to spending less time with your family and go out and doing other things. But I think it's an important question to step back and ask yourself. So this is a book about a lot of things, including uh, learning to deal with winning and losing. And on this eve of anticipating winning or losing, the last word, Stuart, from you is going to be predicting the outcome and the score, if you wish, <laughs> of tomorrow's game. Well. It would be the most Ole Miss thing in the world to lose to Vanderbilt. But I think, I think that Ole Miss, uh, what are they averaging, 62 points a game now? Which, you know, three games in the, to the basketball season, the basketball team would be doing well to be doing that. Uh, 
I, I think they'll have a big win tomorrow. Uh, I, I, they, you know, one of the interesting things, you know, I was watching them, uh, the team as they came off the field uh, in Tuscaloosa, and they, they seemed happy, but they didn't seem shocked. And it was very different than watching them, you know, a year ago when they beat Alabama. Um, so I think they've sort of had a, had a different plateau, and it's an extraordinarily uh, talented team. So I think that they will score uh, north of 50. <laughs> and uh, I would uh, say that uh, Vanderbilt will score 10 points. South of 10. <laughs> On that uh, very happy note, yeah. uh, Stuart, we want to thank you for sharing your oh, insights with you. us today. Thank you very much.